This is Living and Loving Herbs Podcast. This episode is brought to you by farmtobath.com, where our bath and body products are inspired by nature. Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat smelt soaps, body and room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, body oils, using the herbs, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our gardens. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical and GMO free. So make sure you check out farmtobath.com. This episode is brought to you by My Garden Journal, a how-to garden book for kids. Gardening is a learned skill and everybody has to start somewhere. This journal provides the best way to improve your gardening skills to ensure more success and fewer failures. The intent of this journal is to simultaneously teach basic gardening techniques while providing a place to record your journey with important information about the how, when, and where to grow food and flowers. There are suggestions on theme gardens such as a Harry Potter garden, a young chef's garden, or a monarch butterfly superhero garden for budding naturalists and a place to either sketch or photograph your plants to remember their appearance in the next growing season. You'll be amazed at how much you'll learn about journaling about your garden. This book is available in paperback and ebook formats. You can find it in most retail and online stores such as Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Draft2Digital, Kobo, Google iBooks, and local libraries. If you don't find the book, please ask them to order it for you. It is available. If you don't want to wait for the paperback book to arrive, you can download a printable version directly from me at my author website, brendajsullivanbooks.com. That's B. R E N D A J S U L L I V A N B O O K S dot com. Click on the picture and scroll down to the bottom for the PayPal link and follow the prompts. And while you're there, check out all our other books available. Hello. I'm Brenda Sullivan, and this is Living and Loving Herbs podcast, where I discuss different ways you can use herbs, whether it's using them for health purposes, culinary purposes, growing them in your garden, using them in bath and body products, or creating a chemical-free home. I'll share with you its traditions and history, because who doesn't love a good story? If I find a good book related to the subject, resources that might be helpful, I'll share them with a link under book recommendations and reference found in the show notes on Living and Loving Herbs website. The goal of this show is to demystify herbs, their uses, and make it easier for you to incorporate them into your daily life. Today, I'm interviewing Betty Lou Sandy, owner of Betty Lou's Gardening. She is a gardening consultant who helps people with their gardens. She also is the garden coordinator for Spruce Street Community Gardens in Manchester, Connecticut, and does historical garden and history at the Cheney Homestead Museum. Betty Lou is a treasure trove of information, so make sure you grab your notebook and take notes, or better yet, hop over to the website and download her free handouts to, and follow along. She has graciously given you her notes from her gardening classes, and they'll be available for free in the show notes. So make sure you check out LLH website. Some of the topics Betty Lou mentions in our conversation is how to test soil fertility, offering several different methods, scientific and some folk methods, which I found to be fascinating. Easy plants to grow and shortcuts. A cool trick to growing potatoes that totally blew my mind. A simple technique to keeping mosquitoes from laying eggs on rainwater and why rainwater is so important. Environmentally friendly bug spray that will protect your plants from getting eaten alive. If you think the growing season has already passed you by, think again. Betty Lou has an answer for that as well. For my personal update, things in my household are finally calming down. Uh, it's been about a week and a half now since we had our first COVID scare, a.k.a. I'm calling it the Black Plague. 
honestly, guys, it was one of the most stressful and scariest week I've had in a very long time. I told my husband I didn't want to repeat that horror show anytime soon. Um, I really thought this was it. The good news is that I got him through the weekend without calling an ambulance. I had prepared ahead of time for this health crisis, believe it or not. During the five days, I learned a few things while caring for my husband, and I will update the cold and flu ebook that I promised everybody in the COVID pandemic podcast. I've been working on it and tweaking it, um, so I'm going to be updating a few of the recipes because I, I changed some things. But I just want to tell everybody he's fine. You know, he had two COVID tests. Uh, they both came back negative. The official diagnosis is pneumonia, although it's a mild case of pneumonia. It was really crazy. He went from I don't feel good to having a high fever for several days. At one point, he got as high as 104. Uh, thankfully, within 24 hours of starting an antibiotic, he improved quickly and it went as fast as it came. I mean, one day he was fine and the next day he just kind of turned to me and he says, you know, I really don't feel good. I'm burning up. And when I took his temperature on Friday, it was 100.8. I mean, this, this never happens to him. So that's what was wild is that he never runs fevers. Uh, in the 27 years we've been together, I've never seen him this sick. Truly scary. Our daughter, thankfully, didn't catch, or at least so far, hasn't caught anything. I ended up getting a sinus infection. I ended up getting something uh, over the weekend while I was caring for him, and I just treated myself with herbs. I had um, declined medical treatment from our doctor for a variety of reasons, but anyway. Later in the summer, I'll circle back and do a podcast uh, on lessons learned and the protocols I created in treating my husband as if he had COVID and how I navigated the crisis over a weekend when there are no doctor's offices open and no walk-in clinics open. I did call our uh, doctor's office's COVID hotline. There were two nurse practitioners on call. They were wonderful. They really were great in supporting me and making sure that I was doing everything I could for my husband and that I was treating the symptoms properly. At that time, we didn't know. We're still waiting for the test to come back. And then we had to wait for that Monday. And then that's when the doctor came back and uh, he had taken Friday off. So we're kind of like, all right. Uh, what do we do? Uh, have no fear. I had a plan. So my point is create a plan, people. Create a plan. Have a plan. So when things happen, all you have to do is go. You just implement your plan. And we'll talk about more of that later. But before I get started with the interview and all this stuff that was going on with my husband and then all this other stuff that was going on around the world, I want to say a few words about the Black Lives Movement and people of color. My heart is breaking when I saw so many people in pain, but I'm not surprised. This has been going on longer than I've been alive and I'm 56. I'll be 57 in November. Things have to change. Otherwise, the protests will continue and it's time. It's it's time. I mean, I was only a couple weeks old when uh, JFK was murdered, was shot. And, you know, the civil rights movement, all that stuff, it has to change. We have to move forward. Stop, everybody. Just, just stop. I just want to say, I hear you. I see you. I stand with you and I support you in any way that I can, including speaking out on my podcast that is not supposed to be political, but I'm making an exception because it has to be said. Enough is enough, as my friend George Joe Hart had said on his Facebook page shortly after Mr. Floyd was murdered. Enough is enough. I can't agree more. It's change is long overdue. It's time for all of us to demand change and support our black and brown brothers and sisters. But where does one start? I recommend you pick an issue, any issue. You'll find huge racial disparities no matter what you do or what you look at. It's embedded in our fabrics 
bureaucracy, believe it or not. And if you don't think so, then you're, I'm sorry, you're a fool, okay? You're a fool. Organizations have been working on this issue for a long time. They need financial support. They need volunteers. Walking the streets and protesting is not your thing. Then there's other things that you can do. And this is my little thing, is speaking out about it. And also, we support candidates have an agenda that is equality for all, including stop the police brutality. All these issues that are happening are valid issues, and we can support them and walk with them and encourage our leaders change and make things equitable for all. In the show notes, I have collected some links to national organizations that can redirect you to local leaders in your area if you want to connect with them and offer your support. If you search around, you'll find all kinds of issues that you can support, whether it be education, pre-K, elementary, middle school, high school, and college. Racism runs deep in our educational system. I've seen that personally with my own eyes. Many years ago, when I was the chair of the Connecticut State Advisory Council on Special Ed, let me tell you, I saw a lot of school administrators say things that were so racist and that were so wrong. Uh, As a parent, I'm still angry. And I've been off that council for, what, 10 years at this point? I'm still angry about the things that I heard on that council from administrators and how they treated some of their students. You know, mentoring boys and girls who have home issues that need a mentor to show them the way. Voter suppression, fair housing, police violence, community blight, mental health, health care, the environment. You name it, there's huge gaps everywhere. We can step up to the plate and demand that our local leaders change how business is done. I also have links to two books I recommend reading by two women, two different women, who have an incredible message for all of us. And yes, they happen to be black. I am a big believer in reading women's biographies, especially those of color. They have stories to tell. They have lessons that I can learn and you can learn from their stories. And that's how we move forward. Not that it's a dish on the men, but I like to support women candidates in office. I just started reading Stacey Abrams' latest book, Our Time Is Now, Power, Purpose, and the Fight for a Fair America. I have to admit, long before this all started, in 2016, I became a bit of a fangirl of Stacey's. She's a woman on the move, and I love her message a lot. I've seen her on Stephen Colbert. I just like how she thinks. I like how she frames voter suppression arguments. And I like how she shows us how somebody like me, a white female, can help change the way things are done. That's what I'm looking for. Here's her excerpt, the back of the book. Celebrated national leader and best-selling author Stacey Abrams offers a blueprint to end voter suppression, empower our citizens, and take back our country. A recognized expert on fair voting and civic engagement, Abrams chronicles a chilling account of how the right to vote and the principle of democracy have been and continue to be under attack. Abrams would have been the first African-American woman governor, but experienced these effects firsthand despite running the most innovative race in modern politics as the Democratic nominee in Georgia. Abrams didn't win, but she has not conceded. The book's compelling argument for the importance of robust voter protections, an evaluation of identity politics, engagement in the census, and a return to moral international leadership. Our Time Is Now draws on extensive research from the national organizations and renowned scholars, as well as anecdotes from her life and others who have fought throughout our country's history for the power to be heard. The stakes could not be higher. Here are concrete solutions and inspiration to stand up for who we are now. I'm right there. I'm right with this girl. I, I've liked her since 2016. I followed the whole Georgia debacle and the, who is now the governor who literally cheated to make sure that he won. Okay, the other biography, and it won't disappoint you at all, I read this a couple years ago, is Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. 
I found it honest and candid about her feelings about politics in general. Uh, when her husband was running for president, what happened afterwards during the 2016 election? And speaking of her husband, President Obama himself recently stated in a town hall broadcast about what's been going on about the protests in America. And I'm paraphrasing his comments, but he is suggesting we don't stop that we make our local leaders uncomfortable until they agree to make meaningful changes. Don't give up on the fight for justice. If we want change, we need to confront our leaders. And this is the most important thing. Vote. If you're an American, you vote and you make sure that your vote counts. I used to be an independent. I grew up Republican. Um, My parents were as red as you can be. And then... Things changed, and I moved to Connecticut, and I became an independent. And then the 2016 election, I was an independent for over 30 years. And then the 2016 election happened, and I changed to the Democratic Party. And I will not leave the party until things change. Because right now, there is no three-party system. The way Connecticut is, it's only a two-party system. And I wanted to make sure that my Democratic candidates got nominated and elected, which they did. So moving on, um, if you live in another part of the world, I believe the Obama Foundation has resources for you in your particular country that you're from. Uh, You may have to do a little research. You may have to do a little digging. I suggest you contact them if you don't find what you're looking for on their website, on the Obama Foundation website. I would suggest that you contact them and you ask help directing where you can find organizations that protecting human rights, especially voting suppression, because that seems to be a big problem in the world at the moment. I'm sure that they'll be happy to direct you. Now, the other option that you have is also checking out the United Nations Human Rights Commission and I'll have a link for that in the show notes and hopefully there's information about what is available in your country, and then you just kind of go down from there, geographically, all that stuff. And lastly, circling back to gardening, I uh, would be remiss not to include a link to Ron Finley's uh, website. He's a gentleman from my home state, California, and lives in South Central L.A., In 2010, Ron became famous for challenging local zoning ordinances in the city of Los Angeles to plant food in parkways, which are owned by the city. In 2010, growing food on city property was illegal and people were fined or sometimes they were arrested if they didn't remove the illegal contraband. It's like, oh, my God, they're growing pot or something. And all this guy wanted to do was grow a carrot. Yeah, carrot. In his video clip, he explains that he wanted to grow a carrot that wasn't full of toxic chemicals because... Growing up in California, I used to live north of L.A. in an area called the Santa Clarita Valley, and we had bunny love carrots, and they sprayed those carrots. I remember driving by, and we would see them watering the carrots. They had this big, huge tower of, of water, and yeah, they sprayed those puppies and the onions, too. The Onion Fields. There was a movie Oh, <laughs> there's a movie made about it. Check it out. It's called The Onion Fields, 1970s, I think. Anyway, um, thanks to Ron's determination, he got the city to change the zoning ordinances. This was the beginning of Ron Finley Project, which is a nonprofit. He teaches people how to grow healthy food on small plots of land. As Ron demonstrated in his gardening masterclass with a Nike shoe, and believe it or not, a dresser drawer that somebody had thrown away. If it can hold dirt, you can grow something in it. So make sure you check out the website of his masterclass called The Gangsta Godna. Isn't that a cool name? The Gangsta Godna. You'll be in for a treat. Just want to warn you, Ron uses very colorful language and it is not appropriate for young children. So if you're going to take his gardening class, just Beware, the man uses um, very colorful language. Uh, So in the meantime, we have an interview to get to. 
uh, with Betty Lou. She's a master of her own craft. And don't forget to go hop over to the Living and Loving Herbs website and download Betty Lou's handouts, organic gardening, container gardening, vegetable gardening, to-do list. This is an awesome document. It's uh, a calendar on what you can do year-round in the garden. Of course, it's geared toward Northeast gardeners, but you can easily adapt it. It's not that hard. And if you have questions, I'm sure Betty Lou will be happy to help you. Uh, she is just a wealth of information. Finally, uh, she also wrote an article, Where Does uh, Food Come From?, which is a great article. So without further delay, here is the interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, and welcome to the show. I'm Brenda Sullivan. This is Living and Loving Earth. Today's interview, I'll be interviewing Betty Lou Sandy. She is the owner of Betty Lou's Gardening in Manchester, Connecticut. She also does historical gardening and history at the Cheney Homestead Museum, which was established in 1818. She coordinates the facilities uh, and gardeners at the Spruce Street Community Garden in Manchester with 28 beds and 65 gardeners who grow their own food from March to March, year-round growing. She does consulting and personal training of gardening skills for clients who want to do things for themselves and manages multiple Facebook pages, Betty Lou's Gardening, Betty Lou Sandy Spruce Street Community Garden, and Cheney Homestead Museum. Welcome, Betty Lou. Thank you, Brenda, for having me. This is a, a great time to be talking about vegetable gardening. Wonderful. So how did you get started in gardening? Oh, it started back in 1987 when I had been working for the computer industry, and I was also a single parent and needed to have more time to be with my daughter. So in thinking about all the different things I had ever done uh, to make a little money, gardening for seniors who used to do it for themselves but couldn't anymore was uh, the best thing I could think of. And there was a big need for it in the place where I was living down in Wilton, Connecticut. And I decided that's what I was going to do. So I left the, ind the computer industry and went into gardening. And it went from working for seniors to the following year when there had been a big stock market crash and all the landscapers disappeared, I started doing landscaping, detail landscaping, and hired a crew. Then in 89, people wanted to start to learn to do things for themselves. So I started doing gardening consultation and personal training of gardening skills and public speaking. And I've been doing that ever since. So for wow. 30 years, yep. yep. It's a lot of fun. I wouldn't. We first met at the NOFA conference at Manchester. Were you the president at the time? No, I wasn't yet the president. I was uh, teaching seminars for Connecticut NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association. I was also very active with Connecticut NOFA and on the board. Um, Connecticut NOFA so still was. On the board. Yes, I was doing. My In my own business, I was doing all the things that NOFA proposed. I am an organic gardener from the beginning. I don't like to use chemicals or um, bring in things to a property that weren't there to begin with and like to uh, use what's on hand and be as natural as possible with the environment. I figure that um, if we work against nature, we're making more work for ourselves. And if we work with nature, then it's so much easier to have success in the garden, whether you're growing flowers, shrubs, trees, or vegetables. These mm -hmm. days, people want to grow uh, vegetables to have more food security. So I've been very busy helping people to do that. Yeah, I noticed it's the end of it's May first, the time at the time of this recording, May first, twenty twenty. And um, I'm seeing a huge increase in, in people interested in, in doing their own gardening. I sell little uh, grow kits, little microgreen grow kits on Etsy. And I'm selling, I, I couldn't give them away a few years ago. And today I'm selling at least three to four a week, which is just, I was going to pull these off the market. So right now, uh, people are really starting to uh, go back to the soil 
and um, there's shortages of seeds in some seed companies uh, because so many orders. I know Randall was saying um, the Baker Creek went maybe a thousand orders a, a, a day to like ten thousand. They're they're overwhelmed right now. Uh, wow. In a week, I guess. So, but anyway. Um, so I wanted to talk about, um, in general, if somebody wanted to start gardening who has never gardened before, what do you suggest they do first? And it doesn't matter. I mean, we can, we can split this up. We could talk about people who have a, a little backyard to somebody who lives in an apartment and maybe have a small balcony to somebody who doesn't have any space, uh, no balcony, maybe have a window, or I don't even, well, for growing microgreens, you really don't need a window, you don't need direct light. Um, but if somebody wanted to, to grow a little something for themselves to help, you know, feed themselves or their family, what what do you suggest they do? Do they rent a backhoe? <laughs> I always suggest that you start small. Um, mm -hmm. If you've never gardened before, starting in one container, or one small space in your yard is the best way to do it. And then you can build on your success because vegetable gardening can be very confusing, especially if you want to grow uh, more than three different vegetables at one time. Each vegetable has its own need. And um, it's important to be aware of the needs of the different things that you're growing. If you're just in a, an apartment and you might have a balcony or uh, a little space somewhere that you can have a few containers, that's a good way to start. Um, mm -hmm. I suggest using containers that you have on hand rather than buying something new. I like to help people to save money as well as save energy when they're gardening rather than uh, buying new equipment and new, new materials unless you have to. Mm -hmm. You can use a container of any kind, mm -hmm. um, whether it's um, big pots that you might have had for other plants or you might have uh, some storage tubs that you're not using anymore. And you can poke holes in the bottom of those and fill them with soil and compost and, and peat moss uh, and you'll have a nice loose mix to grow almost anything. That's mm -hmm. a really good way to get started. My very first tomato plant was in a five-gallon bucket on a back porch of a um, three-story apartment, and mm -hmm. I had yeah. great success. Yeah, tomato plants are great for containers, I have to say. I grow a lot. Well, when I run out of bed space, I I have um, these tubs that I got from uh, Home Depot. They're, they're actual totes storage totes and I drilled holes in the bottom of them and I, I plant extra tomato plants in those and I line them up against the greenhouse uh, and that works out well. That's a great idea. As long as you have at least um, eight to ten hours of direct sunlight for tomatoes, they'll do very, very well. If you have less sunlight, they'll uh, grow more slowly and you have to, um, they will not develop quite as, as well and as quickly. But with proper care, you can get very good fruit out of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just have to water. They dry out fast. You have to water them a lot. Yes, that's true. Containers dry out much more quickly than, than uh, being in the ground. That's why I like using uh, frame raised beds at least two feet high. That will ensure that there's plenty of root space for the tomatoes that like deep soil. And it'll also uh, hold in the moisture without requiring uh, too much work. Um, so if somebody had a backyard, yeah. and you wouldn't, would you recommend that they go get like a rototiller and they dig it all up? Or do you recommend that they start simple and just put in a, a, a raised bed in what dimensions? How big should it be? Is there, I know Paul had created, my husband had built in the beginning early days he built these monster beds i mean they were too big i couldn't right. they were hard to maintain so is there if somebody do you what do you recommend if somebody has a backyard 
and they want to put in a garden. If you want to do a framed raised bed, it's the simplest way to go because you can plant your plants closer together than you would if they were in flat rows. Because flat mm -hmm. rows uh, will use 40% of their area for pathways and you will be compacting the soil in between the plants. So the plants will not have enough root space. The plants that are put in a frame grazed bed that's two feet deep um, will thrive because they have deep root space and you don't have to turn the soil every year. You can mulch with straw or leaves uh, all through the year and you won't have weeds. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a wonderful thing. My Spruce Street Community Garden in Manchester has all frame raised beds, uh, anywhere from one foot to three foot deep. We all we always do a double dig to um, make Spring it nice and deep. Digging. Well, you dig down once, and then uh, in the same hole you dig out another shovelful, and so you're down a good uh, foot and a half below the surface anyway. And you do that all through the whole uh, garden area and it will bulk up the soil because there'll be so much more air in the soil. And mm -hmm. when you actually plant after it settles, um, the roots will have much more soil to go through. It'll also allow you to take out any rocks and so forth. I use mm -hmm. um, two by 12 by 12 foot boards um, and that means two inches thick by 12 inches wide and 12 feet long but I cut off a four foot part so you need two 12 foot lengths to make a four foot by eight foot bed okay and that's a good way to start um, then I take all the rubble stone rocks that might come out of the soil and any rocks you might have around, and I make a trench around the perimeter of the bed where the uh, wood is going to sit. And that way it prevents the moisture from rotting the wood. It also prevents uh, burrowing creatures like voles and woodchucks and bunny rabbits from going underneath the bed and then eating the roots of all your crops. Yeah, we had a big problem with voles. Oh, they were horrible. Um, and Paul ended up having to put hardware wire. He dug out all the beds, all 22 of them, and put in hardware wire because I was getting eaten alive. Right. Well, using a, um, a deep trench around it filled with rocks will help the wood to last longer. It'll also hold moisture for up to two weeks after the rain, so it'll be available for the roots of the plants. And it also prevents the voles from getting in. So well, we'll have to do that next time we have to do, time we rebuild our beds. I'll have them do that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, I have a whole um, PowerPoint and uh, document about that with sketches as how, how that can all be uh, done. Um, Did you get but otherwise, it? oh, sure. Um, okay. I can also recommend uh, another way of doing it is using those uh, storage totes with the holes poked in them. And you can mm -hmm. put a series of those together side by side right on the ground and so that you can fill them with your soil without doing all the digging. And you can have a variety of different uh, plants in each. Each one will be a different variety of plants. For instance, your tomatoes require acid soil, which is best done by adding uh, animal manure, such as cow manure or horse manure or um sheep manure or goat manure, that type of thing. Oh, and bunny rabbit manure is the best if anybody raises rabbits. Um, but you can put extra manures in the soil that are going to do the tomatoes or peppers or eggplant because they require acid soil. All the other plants 
require a more neutral soil. Um, so you would add lime to any of those other bins so that mm-hmm. you could grow your squash, cucumbers, um, lettuce, spinach, that type of thing. Uh, you can also trellis in the big bins by putting some tall sticks in the in the ground and running some um, string or wire between the sticks and allow your cucumbers or squash or string beans to crawl up these these uh, strings and it's easier to to harvest that way. Also, when you do vertical gardening, you're uh, saving a lot of space. How big do you think the totes need to be? Um, as long as they're at least a foot and a half to two feet deep, and uh, you want to allow about a foot and a half across and two or three feet long, that would be really good. A nice way to begin. Uh, and you okay. put a bunch of these together. So they have to be big totes. Um, and a lot of times when we're downsizing in the recent years, uh, you have a lot of them left and you just poke holes in them mm-hmm. and you just put them together. And for the tomato plants, there'll be lots of room to put the tomato cages. Now here in Manchester, Connecticut, where I live in August, we tend to have heavy winds and that's when the tomato plants have the big fruit on them. So mm-hmm. if you don't tie the tomato cages together, uh, they're going to blow over. So this is one way that I can keep them stable is to tie the cages together and make sure there's a stake along the um, stem of each of the tomatoes and they stay standing upright. By the way, tomatoes mm-hmm. are actually a vine and they, they normally are on the ground, but I find that they're much healthier and easier to tend if I stake them. Mm-hmm. That means even when you have this little baby plant that you're putting in the ground, you need a very tall stake and put a, uh, a support around the whole thing so that you'll be able to tie it up as it grows and you won't disturb mm-hmm. the root system. You don't make a differentiation between determinate or indeterminate tomatoes. You just always stake your tomatoes no matter what. That's right. Um, I find it much easier to do it that way. I can't remember which one. One requires staking and one doesn't. Right. The heirlooms, I have to be, they have to be uh, staked. Otherwise, you just have a big mess on the ground. Right. Now, I'd also like to point out that each plant likes a different kind of temperature of the air. We're, we got off talking about tomatoes just now, and they're a very tropical plant. Uh, that's a warm weather plant. So you have to wait until the end of May to, or after the fear of frost to uh, plant tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, squash, cucumbers, and that type of thing. But in the springtime, and then again in the fall, you can plant cold weather crops. Um, mm-hmm. Things such as lettuce, spinach, peas, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale. Those are all cold weather crops. And here in New England, we can plant those right now. Um, mm-hmm. And on the um, wherever you are, you can start planting peas after the after the major snow time, which here in Connecticut is usually March, early April. Um, mm-hmm. And you can then plant uh, the other cold crops uh, in, anywhere from early April to the beginning of May. Um, now, these you recommend to be direct seeded and not started in the house. I was at the, the nursery the other day. I was surprised to see that they had started, you know, peas in pots and corn and all these vegetables that I thought should be direct seeded. So talk about the differences between which plants would be better direct seeded and, and what plants would be better to be started earlier or purchased and then plant it. Okay, that's a very good question. Um, now, again, it's a complicated one to answer in some respects. Peas 
I usually direct sow into the ground after I have soaked them at least for a few hours. Uh, but at this time of year, here we are May 1st, I would plant the uh, baby plants directly in the ground. Peas that have been soaked overnight will germinate much more rapidly, usually within a, uh, a couple of days. Um, if you plant seeds that are not soaked, they might take a week to germinate. Uh, right mm-hmm. now, I had planted seeds direct sowed in my vegetable garden six weeks ago, and they're up by four inches right now because it had gotten very cold for a little while in our environment, so it slowed down. But if you put seeds in right now that, that have been soaked, they will germinate in just a couple of days, and they'll shoot up. Then you'll be um, harvesting your peas, I'd say, by the end of May and through the beginning of July. Uh, with broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and kale, at this time of year, I would use uh, starter plants that you can buy at a nursery or that you would have started about uh, six weeks ago if you didn't put them directly in the ground. Um, mm-hmm. Now, tomato plants, I always start early. And then I'll put the baby plants into the, into the ground or the containers uh, the end of May. Usually I'll put okay. tomato plants in when they're uh, at least a foot tall and mm-hmm. pretty sturdy. Um, and sometimes I can buy them <laughs> uh, if I haven't been successful uh, with fruit on already. And that's always a fun mm-hmm. thing to do because then I'll have tomatoes uh for the mi- beginning the middle of july which is a mm-hmm. very fun because when you plant tomatoes you just can't wait for the juicy sweetness of the first tomato right off the vine there's nothing better yeah uh, oh, i agree well love homegrown tomatoes yeah but for the other plants uh especially for a beginning gardener uh, I like to recommend that you acquire some uh, starter plants from a grower, whether it's a neighbor, a friend, or a nursery, and look for some good sturdy plants. You don't want, if you're a beginner, you don't want more than six of any one kind of plant because uh, it can get a little more complicated. And when you plant things all at the same time, then you get your harvest all at the same time. And you're not going to enjoy it as much. So I like to plant things at staggered intervals. So you'll have a staggered harvest. Now, most of your plants are going to uh, show ripe vegetables ready to pick at different intervals. Anyway, Mm -hmm. on your tomatoes, At the grocery store, you usually see tomatoes on the vine and all of them are red all at once. It's not true. At the grocery stores, they gas them so they'll look like that. On the vine, you'll get two red ones at a time. And that's nice because you pick two red ones and you're ready and you enjoy them. And then another day or two and you've got another few red red ones and so forth. And your harvest will last for um, weeks if not longer. I also like planting um, vegetables of the same kind, but of different ages, if you're going to do it all at the same time, or plant them at one week intervals. I know people who have planted too many tomatoes or squash all at the same time. It all comes in at once, and then they end up giving it away or not knowing how to process it. So... I like to encourage you to just take it slowly so you'll be able to enjoy your harvest and maybe even put some away for the winter time. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's talk about dirt. You now, um, why shouldn't I just go get a shovel and just shovel use that dirt? Uh, what's the difference between soil and um, and a regular topsoil? Gardening soil versus topsoil. Good question. Your best success starts with the soil. And good soil, whether you're growing lawn or or flowers or vegetables, uh, has to be good soil. And you want to pay attention to what kind of soil you have. 45% of healthy soil are minerals, which is sand, silt, 
clay, and organic matter, which is the topsoil. Um, but the sand, silt, clay, rocks, pebbles, that's all your 45%. And then 25% of your soil should be air, and you need 25% air in the soil so that the uh, 25% of moisture can go through the soil and get to the roots of, of your plants. You also need air in the soil for the nutrients to get through the uh, soil to get to the roots of your plants. Then you only need 5% topsoil or organic matter to build your 100% of healthy soil. Now, the topsoil that you mentioned, uh, most yards and gardens have less than 2% topsoil these days, and most farms have discovered that they have less than half of 1% uh, of topsoil and organic matter in their soil. So they're having to do deep tillage to start to uh, bring up the nutrients from the ground and also to allow the weeds to grow so they can build up the topsoil. Now, the topsoil you buy at a store or bring in by a truckload, you don't know what the pH is or what the... Um, fertility is or the com kind of soil you're getting. So you have to do a soil test with it, no matter whether it's from your yard or when you bring it in. There are many different tests you can do. You can do a visual test to see what's growing there now and um, how healthy it is. You can do a shake-up test, which is to take a large jar with a tight-fitting lid and fill it three-quarters of the way with the soil you're testing. Make sure there are no pebbles in it, though. And add a drop of dishwashing liquid, preferably not antibacterial, and shake it up. Oh, fill it with water, yes. And then shake it up. And um, by, the mm -hmm. by the next day, you'll see the strata in the jar as to um, what you have in your soil. You can do a perk test, a watering test, Earthworm population test, by the way, if, if you um, dig a hole about one foot by one foot by one foot, and you've got six worms in it, you've got very good soil. But if, oh. yeah. and if you have no earth, I never heard of that. yeah, it's an earthworm test. And then if you um, don't have any earthworms, you know that uh, there's too many chemicals in it soil and the earthworms don't like it. Or um, you can do a chemical analysis of your soil to see how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium you have. Um, and for those of you who are accustomed to uh, fertilizer bags, the uh, three numbers that are separated by dashes, the end, mm -hmm. that first mm -hmm. number is nitrogen. And then the next number is phosphorus. And then Third number is potassium. And um, each one of those is required for a certain aspect of growth in the plant. Um, nitrogen is for the foliage, phosphorus is for the roots, and potassium is for the stems. Um, mm -hmm. Then you need, and you can have too much of one of them, and you can also have too, too little of one of them. And if you get a basic... Mm -hmm chemical fertilizer that says 10, 10, 10, that might not do for your, your soil. You, so it's best to mm -hmm. add to your soil what it is you do need. Um, your pH, we'll talk about the acidity of your soil. Now, I mentioned that tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant like a lot of acid, so that would be a lower pH. And all the other vegetables like a neutral or sweet soil. Now, if you have a very acidic soil where violets or, or um, dandelions are growing, you need to add lime if you don't want the violets and dandelions. <laughs> but you can also add... Mm -hmm. Well, those are, those are food. That's food. It is food. But most people will look at the dandelions and, and uh, violets and say, oh, they're weeds. Thank you for mentioning their food. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I, just... I, I cultivate dandelions, by the way, because their greens 
are so nutritious. And they were brought in by the colonists um, back in the 1600s. Yeah. And they came from Europe. Mm-hmm. And they, aren't there about 29 different uses for dandelions in, ter- in the herb world? Mm-hmm. Yep. And they're, they're great natural diuretics. So if you, if you retain water naturally, di, uh, and they're a bitter, so it helps with the digestive juices as well as uh, helps naturally shed water. So um, you, if you take water pills or you naturally retain water, start eating dandelions. Ah, that's great. Um, and the greens are very nutritious, especially in the springtime when we need the extra vitamins. Um, mm-hmm. Vitamin C, yep. And sometimes people have um, too much salt in, in their soil or um, chemicals have been used in the soil. And we use a mineral called gypsum that can neutralize the chemicals in road salts. Uh, that is a mineral that will encapsulate the road salt or, or chemical or pet damage and wash it away when it rains or when you water. So that's another way to mm-hmm. take care of your soil. Um, herbs usually need sandy soil. Talk about compost. Compost, well. Yes, yeah, talk about the compost. All right. Compost is a wonderful spongy material that naturally holds moisture in the soil. It also adds nitrogen naturally to the soil and will um, give little nodules of nitrogen to the plant roots and then the roots will take up the nitrogen as they need it, not being force fed like chemical fertilizers would. If anybody has ever used miracle Grow, that's high nitrogen that is uh, force fed into the plants. So you'll get quick growth of the greenery, the foliage, And um, it will grow so quickly that it will be more susceptible to disease and insects. But if you use compost Mm -hmm. as a natural fertilizer and soil improvement, then you'll have um, plants that are inoculated with uh, antivirus and they will repel most of the problem bugs. This, this. So how often do you recommend compost being used? So if you start your garden, do you recommend that they, they top dress or mix compost in to their, to their dirt? Or, and then what about during the growing season? Well, when you first start your, your uh, garden, for instance, if you're filling containers, I mix in a small amount of compost with the soil. Now, remember, when I was talking about the uh, healthy soil, you only need 5% organic matter. That's true of the compost. Mm -hmm. That's going to be your organic matter, additional organic matter. So you wouldn't put more, any more than 5% in the soil. Otherwise, the compost will start uh, digesting the plant material that you're putting in the soil because that's the job of compost Mm -hmm. is the uh, natural bi- biology in the soil will be fed by any organic matter that's in the soil. So um, you only 5% in your new soil. Then you can also add uh, just a little bit, a little bit of covering on the surface of the soil to gently work the nutrients and biology into the soil as it rains. Oh, let's talk about water. Speaking of rain. Uh, rainwater is the best. Okay. Rainwater is the best water for your um, garden, and I use rain barrels connected to a downspout at a house or buckets along a roof line that drips down anyway. Um, mm-hmm. And then I'll use that as my rainwater, my uh, watering water, and I do all my watering by hand in the home vegetable garden because each plant has a different need. Now, at some of my gutters, we get so much water off the roof, and it's going to be happening more and more as we get the heavy rains with climate change. Um, I connect one rain barrel to another big barrel, and in, in many cases, I'll have three barrels all connected. I use very large 55-gallon drums or huge garbage cans to collect my rainwater 
mm-hmm. and then connect them with a um, uh, a two inch hose by drilling a hole into the side of the taller one and then siphoning that water into the next one and another into the next one. So I have them on graduated right. levels and I'll build a platform for the primary one. And then it's able to mm-hmm. siphon water when it fills into the next level down. And so you, so you don't worry about contaminants off the, the roof from the, the roof tiles? No, the first, the first rain of, of the year will wash everything off. Um, and you don't okay. need the water at that time anyway. And also, right. if, if the rain barrels and buckets are open, if they're standing uh, water, I'll put a, a drop of lemon-scented dishwashing liquid, preferably not antibacterial, into each of the buckets if they're standing more than two days. And that will break the surface tension of the water so that mosquitoes can't land and lay their eggs because mosquitoes... Okay, that was the other thing. Yeah. You see, um, mosquitoes love to lay their eggs on water. And usually there's surface tension so they can land on the water, lay their eggs, and go away. But... So how often do you do the dish soap? Um, if it's standing more than two days, I do that. And if if it's a large rain barrel um, that's pretty much covered, I'll do that... Um, once or twice a month okay. uh, because the I had never heard of that. Uh, dishwashing liquid, preferably not antibacterial, is a wetting agent that breaks the surface tension of the water. If you've ever done dishes and uh, the suds have gone away and there's uh, the oils of, of your dirty dishes have, ha, are rising to the surface and so forth, you put a drop of dishwashing liquid in there or a squirt, and all of a sudden you see it race away from, from where the squirt was. Ever notice that? Mm-hmm. And yes. that's what it yes. does to the surface t- uh, tension of the, of the water. So, okay, well, that's cool. I had never heard of that before. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you end up with all the larva, uh, mosquito larva, you know, just bouncing around in your, in your water. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. of course, if you dip your bucket into the, the water with the larva and you um, water your plants with it, that's adding more, more nutrients to the plants. But it's best to just... Well, that's usually what I do. I beg your pardon? I just... I just I, I'll leave... I'll leave a five-gallon bucket out in the garden, and I'll catch the rainwater. Right. Then I'll, and then you know, if I, I just leave it there. And of course, you, after a couple of days, you see the the, the larva float swimming around in the bucket. Sometimes um, my husband Paul gets upset with me because he doesn't want standing water because he's afraid of the of getting you know the West Nile virus, right. which is prevalent here. Or Eastern quite, quite what is it? The Eastern. Equine. Uh, equa, 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 equine, thank you, Yeah, um, is another big problem. So he, he gets after me about leaving buckets, but I had not heard of putting the soil. But, yeah, I just take a scoop, and I just scoop out the with the with the stuff swimming around in it. Right. And use it that way. But um, if you pay attention to it and, and just uh, put a few drops in, not a squirt, just a few drops, that's all it takes. Um, mm-hmm. I bought before this, the, the, uh, uh, quarantine, I used to stock up on lemon scented dishwashing liquid, preferably not antibacterial when it was on sale. And, uh, so I always have a, a good quali- quantity of that. Uh, what about the bar soap? I beg your pardon? Does it have to be liquid? Does it have to be liquid soap? Because I, I make a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a soaper. Right. You know, I make goat's milk soap. So I'm just wondering whether if I took a little corner of like the lemon balm soap and put that in the bucket, do you think that that would work? Um, just a small piece of a solid? Yeah, the liquid is easier to, to dissolve and you'll be using less of it. Uh, with the soap, um, it, it has to dissolve. So might as well with mm-hmm. a, a liquid. Okay. Well, it's because I don't buy liquid soap. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, something like um, Ajax, Dove, a store brand. The store brand is just fine and it costs mm-hmm. less. And uh, usually I can get them for about a dollar. So, it, and that'll mm-hmm. last you most of the summer. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I also use that for my basic bug spray. I'll take a one quart mister bottle, fill it up with water, and then put a healthy squirt of the lemon scented dishwashing liquid, preferably not antibacterial, in the um, in the sprayer. And that'll be my basic bug spray. So if I get aphids or um, uh, spider mites or something of that nature, I can just spray it on, on the plant. What about those white moths? Yeah, same Does thing. Does it work for the white moth? Yep, that works too. So what about the green, those little, those little green, the green worms, which end up being the white moth? Yeah. I get those all over my calendula flowers. This will um, um, not only repel them, but it'll get rid of them. I use it in indoors on my house plants as well. It ends up being a mister. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll clean the pores of the leaves as well as uh, keep the bugs away or kill the bugs if they're there. And it's non-toxic. It won't hurt anybody. So that's lemon-scented mm-hmm. dishwashing liquid, preferably not antibacterial, um, into a mister bottle that's filled with water. You just put a healthy squirt mm-hmm. in, and that's your bug spray. Oh, okay. Now, let's talk about sunlight and light. Now, it, over the years, you've, you've uh, had a full disclosure here, people, but Betty Lou, we've hired Betty Lou to consult in our, in our, uh, in our yard in, in past years. But over the years, my garden originally started out with full sun. And then um, over the years, trees have grown. Um, they're not my trees, they're my neighbor's trees. And so I'd say about a fourth of my garden is now in shade. So I've had to learn how to adapt um, what plants would do better in the shade. So on that particular side of the garden, that's where I, I plant my garlic and um, some of my, I actually grow wine cap mushrooms in some of the beds that get full shade, uh, and that does very well. What do you suggest if, if somebody has a yard and they can't take, they don't have a lot of sun, what plants would you recommend uh, would be growing in, in a yard or an area where there's just no direct sunlight? Best thing to do there are the cold weather crops, such as uh, lettuce varieties, spinach, peas. Uh, they still need some indirect sunlight, but they will do very nicely in the, in the uh, partial shade. Uh, there's, mm-hmm. You can try doing kale. My rule of thumb is the broader the leaf, the more shade it likes. The smaller the leaf, the more sun it likes. That's true with... Oh, that's a good analogy. Yeah. That's true of, of flowers, shrubs, and trees. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of vegetable plants, you can grow your cold weather crop reasonably well because they don't like the hot summer sun. That's mm-hmm. one reason why they do well in the uh, spring and again in the fall because it's indirect sun mm-hmm. and it's cooler temperatures. Yeah. You'll notice that in the shade, it's usually about 15 to 20 degrees cooler than out in the middle of the sun. That's nature's mm-hmm. uh, air conditioning. You'll also notice that there's a little breeze in the shade because of the convection currents of the air. Cold air will mm-hmm. drop and warm air will rise and it'll circulate to make a little breeze in the shade under trees. Now, if you mm-hmm. really do need some extra sun and your neighbor's branches of their trees are hanging over your property, legally you can prune back some of those branches. But when pruning, always do it at a junction or new growth. So there is a um, another sub-branch, so to speak, a smaller branch uh, aiming out from that cut where you do your, your pruning. Mm-hmm. That way it'll still provide you some shade. It'll be healthy for the tree. And um, uh, you won't have as many branches leaning over. But you were right to put mm-hmm. your garlic there because you don't plant garlic until October. And by then, the foliage mm-hmm. on the trees is gone or about to be. And it'll have all winter to work on its, its bulb underground. And then in the springtime, it'll send up its shoots so it can uh, finish off all of its growth. And then you get the garlic scape mm-hmm. in June. And then you harvest it in 
July. Mm-hmm. Why well, ask a cheat? I will go to the grocery store and I'll buy organic garlic. And in the spring, I will plant the cloves in that bed and I will harvest them as uh, garlic chives. Oh. Um, I don't wait for the garlic to full. And then I, whatever's left will, will overwinter. I'll just leave it in the ground and I'll just keep going back. And I call it cut and come again. Oh. So I just keep cutting um, and have garlic chives. Okay. That works. My you get more nutrients that way, too. Um, but a lot of people like the whole uh, bulb with the with the uh, six cloves on it, four, between four and six yeah. cloves. Yeah. No. Well, that's that's very good. Yeah. Usually the, in the fall, I can't find seed garlic, be, and I'm too late because I've been busy going to the farmer's markets and craft fairs, and by the time I realize... Um, and I forget, I forget, always forget to buy seed garlic in the late summer. So, eh, it's a, it's okay. I just sell sell the uh, the garlic chives. Good. Or I add them into salad mixes and stuff. Okay, so top ten vegetables for a beginning gardener. What are your your must haves um, that you recommend um, for beginning gardeners to grow? And that's you know either. Well, we talked about this earlier where you buy them from either already grown or sowed. Uh, usually the top ten list is plants that you would sow from seed. Um, carrots and lettuce you sow from seeds. By the way, you can uh, do carrots and lettuce and, and spinach uh, through the winter also in at a window. Uh, but that's another topic. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you have no room outside, you can grow lettuce, spinach, and radishes in the house at a window, uh, in, in your uh, window mm-hmm. boxes. Those are easy to do, as long as it's not getting uh, direct sunlight in the summertime. Uh, the heat and the, and the direct sun of the summer will cause lettuce and spinach to bolt which means it goes to seed. Mm-hmm. And then um, when you pick it, there's a, a milky substance that comes out of the veins, and that mm-hmm. means it's going to be very bitter. But mm-hmm. uh, the easiest things to grow are lettuce, spinach, radishes, string beans, peas. Um, those are very easy. Uh, peas, like I said mm-hmm. before, like the cooler weather, an indirect sun. But the string beans like the warmth of the season. So that's something you want um, starting in the middle of May. You can plant those direct seed. Again, though, uh, any seed that you can see and hold, that can be soaked overnight before you plant it. Squash is a good one, too. Any, yes. Um, any, seed any seed. You would pre soak Yes. You can't do that with the little baby seeds, the little bitty seeds like uh, spinach and, and lettuce and, and carrots because you can't pick them up individually. So you have to plant them by yeah. by seed. I Yeah, direct sow. Or you can buy the baby plants. Um, okay. Now, if you buy the baby plants, you might as well buy the, the food but uh, because of the price. But you can um, mm-hmm. start everything by seed. Also, uh, I didn't mention potatoes. Potatoes are something that's a very good um, vegetable to grow, but it's not something you're going to eat during the summer. They will be growing through the summer and into the fall. You harvest them in the fall, but it can be a fun thing to do in one of your containers, your deep tubs, because I do Mm -hmm. uh, layering. Uh, Now, they didn't do this 200 years ago, but... We do it now in small spaces. You can even go to the dollar store and get one of those, a couple of the laundry baskets that have open sides and mm-hmm. lots of uh, grid on the bottom so the, the soil can go through mm-hmm. it, the roots can go through it. Um, I will put that on the ground and fill it with sandy soil. You can buy a bag of sand at, at uh, your local garden center and you mix the sand in with soil equal parts. And you put uh, about six inches of soil in the bottom of the basket. Then you put your pieces of potato that have eyes in them that are sprouting already. 
Mm-hmm. Most people have, have potatoes that have, are sprouting eyes, and too many people throw them away or just snap off the eyes. But if you cut that part out, leaving enough potato for the root to grow, you put each piece um, about eight inches apart in a circle and then a few more in the middle. And then you cover it over again with another three or four inches of, of soil and wait for the stems to come up and the foliage to appear. And then about a week later, you put another row of of these chunks of potato with the eyes or stems, and you cover those over. And you wait about a week, week and a half. And when the foliage is up on all of them, and you're seeing the stems and so forth, you can put another layer, and you can go up to five layers, and you keep putting more soil and a little bit of compost and um, and you water it on a regular basis until it's up as tall as you want. And then through the summer, you keep watering it and you might throw a little bit of uh, compost or a spoma garden tone on, on the surface of the soil while you're watering. And then um, in the fall, tip the baskets over and all the potatoes fall out. <laughs> oh, I've tried that. I, well, I did it in grow bags. I didn't get any. I was. Well, I, I didn't get anything. Um, but I, you don't bury. Do you bury the uh, the basket in the ground? Do you just leave it on top? You can leave ground. it on top, but you can also put it in the ground. Um, and it's fun because you just lift it out and you pour out your your potatoes. Yeah, I tried. I tried growing, doing that. It didn't work. Of course, I had the potatoes in front of the greenhouse. Yeah, and I think it just got too hot. Um, and I, the plants were the grow bag is going to be um, uh, holding in the heat, and it's also not going to get the benefits of the uh, earthworms and natural biology of the soil because the heat of the grow bag is going to uh, kill all the beneficial bacteria and eventually uh, kill off the plant as well. Uh, the grow bags are cute, but okay. you have to cover them with something to prevent it from getting too hot. That's why I'm using the open basket. You can also yeah. use chicken wire. You just leave them on top of the ground? Yes. Um, you can even use chicken wire to um, uh, hold your tower. It's a tomato a potato tower and um okay uh yeah you can i found the grow bags to be perfect for growing carrots okay now um but not potatoes right now with carrots you can grow those in a bucket or a container as long as it has um holes in the bottom again you need sandy soil because the carrots Mm -hmm. need to grow deep. And in regular soil, it's too heavy to allow the carrot roots to uh, go deeply into the soil, and you'll end up with stubby carrots. So you want three quarters of the soil to be sand, and then um, the rest of it to be uh, topsoil and a little compost, and you keep them watered. Now, carrots Mm -hmm. are going to take a long time to germinate, so you have to be very patient. And again with carrots, I will plant a row of carrots every week so that um, Mm -hmm. I'll get a longer yield. In the fall, it's even better because if you start in late August um, planting carrots, then you harvest what you need through the fall and leave the rest in the ground and then you harvest them uh, when you need them in the winter using a digging fork to get them out of the ground. Usually in October. The frost doesn't uh, freeze them? Yeah. Do you take everything out after the frost or you just leave them in? I leave them in the ground in the sandy soil and in October I'll mulch them with with straw. That will protect the top okay. section of the um where the greens were so i'll mm-hmm. cover them with straw or even with uh, leaves that fall from the trees i like using that as mulch it adds nutrients to the soil through the winter time uh and i just go out and use my digging fork to dig right right down and pop up sweet crunchy carrots even in in um january and february wow so you, when you say you plant carrots every week for a beginning gardener, you would start right now. Say they got they have carrot seeds every week all the way through. Till no, every week the, for about four weeks. 
four weeks. Yep. Okay. Yep. And in the fall, in August, late August, I do the same thing for about four weeks. Okay. Got it. Yep. Okay. So we talked about fertilizing already. Um, primping, pampering, and pruning. Uh, when to primp, when to pamper, and when to prune. What plants do you recommend? Squash and cucumber vines will get very long. And um, it's another good reason for trellising. I use a 45-degree uh, angle trellis that I use from a window frame, and I'll put wires across it so it can, um, or I'll use the window frame with some kind of uh, wire fencing to cover it over it so obviously you're taking the glass out right yeah or a uh, screen uh, a lot of people have um i was collecting the aluminum window frames when people were uh, replacing all their aluminum windows a few years back mm -hmm. and then putting um chicken wire or bunny rabbit wire uh over them so when the vines are crawling up the the um the wire the wire fencing they would shade what was underneath and also i could uh just reach under under the 45 degree angle um frame and harvest my cucumbers squash and and whatever else i'm i'm growing string beans too so mm -hmm. in terms of pruning, you don't want the vines to get more than um, six feet long because then it's giving all of its energy to the foliage rather than to the vegetables. And you'll get smaller vegetables mm -hmm. if they get too long. I know some people like to just let the vines go as long as they want and they just pick all the vegetables as they go. But um, if I want to get a lot of healthy vegetables and be able to maintain it properly i cut them back have you ever noticed mm -hmm. those big um the big jumbo pumpkins or the major the big yep. pumpkins will be grown by allowing one pumpkin to grow and cutting back the vine so all the nutrient and fertilizer goes into that one pumpkin to get it bigger and bigger and bigger so think of it this way if you want more and better squash, you're going to cut it back about six feet when it starts getting too long. And you can prune back the branches of each, each of the vines so that your blossoms are going to produce better produce. And it'll continue to blossom mm -hmm. because um, the plant wants to reproduce itself. You see, each one of the vegetables mm -hmm. is actually a seed pod. We're eating seed pods. And the plant mm -hmm. wants to reproduce itself by producing seeds. If you were to leave those plants alone, they would be producing their seed pods, which are the vegetables. And then it would um, die back and the seeds would go into the soil and produce many more plants. But we mm -hmm. prevent it from reproducing itself by harvesting. Now, the squash will have a male and a female blossom. The male blossoms won't show a, a, a new vegetable coming behind it, a little ball thing. It's true with zucchini and winter mm -hmm. squash and summer squash. A female blossom will show a little ball behind it, which is your baby uh, squash. And it will squash will get bigger and bigger. I like to harvest them when they're, they're small and tender. And I'll snap it mm -hmm. off and more blossoms will show up because it's the plant thinks it still hasn't reproduced itself so it'll continue to produce for a good six to eight weeks mm -hmm. now with the, you recommend pruning tomatoes tomatoes i always um wait till the tomatoes are starting to show fruit once they start producing fruit you can start cutting back any non-fruiting vines when you see blossoms on a vine or a branch you know it's going to produce more vegetables so i prune back mm -hmm. the non-fruiting vines especially the ones um uh, that are getting too long and i prune those back i will let it grow tall until it gets to be six feet at the most and then i'll start mm -hmm. snipping that back mm -hmm. then all the energy is mm -hmm. going into the fruit itself uh Mm -hmm. When I have pruned back the non-fruiting vines and the fruiting vines, the fruiting branches start to get too long, I'll just cut part of that back, back to where there's a leaflet on the 
on the branch because it still needs some energy, mm -hmm. but most of the energy is going to go into the fruit. By the time you're in full fruit, you need very little um, foliage on the plant. So I start snipping off as many leaves as possible. You might notice mm -hmm. that they're, uh, the tomato plants are starting to get um, brown towards the bottom. That usually means somebody's been smoking mm -hmm. cigarettes around it or Somebody's been, been spraying chemicals nearby. So um, yeah. that's the tomatoes are very susceptible to anything like that. I'll take the bottom. Smoking cigarettes. Yeah. That's a new one. I never heard of that. The, the, the tomatoes can detect cigarettes. Smoke? Yes. And if, so, and if you have a neighbor that's spreading uh, chemical fertilizers on their lawn, they can, they can sense that also. Wow. Um, Let's talk about planting tomatoes. When I okay. when I'm planting a, a a baby tomato plant that I get from a greenhouse or if I've started, I'll um, take off all the bottom branches before I plant it. I'll dig a nice deep hole mm -hmm. so that the little root system can go at the bottom of the hole, and um, only a few of the leaves are showing at the top of the ground. So I'm I'm planting it extra deep. If you want to really get a head start with your tomatoes, I'll dig the deep hole and put some composted cow manure in the bottom of it, and then put about three or four inches of soil on top of that. Then I'll put the base, the root base into the bottom of the hole, uh, in the soil part, that is, and uh, plant the deep the stem nice and deep so that it'll have, you did, they need a lot of extra root space. So I put it nice and deeply. And then when I uh, fill the hole, I've got some of the branches with leaves on top, but it's planted deeply. It's going to establish its roots, and then once it's it's well established, the roots will start hitting the composted manure, and then it'll give it a shot of, of nitrogen, and it'll start to really grow well. Um, but you need it to work on its root system before it gets that big shot. I water the plants yeah. before I uh, put them in the ground, and then I water the plants after I plant them. Baby plants require mm -hmm. daily watering for the first two weeks, and then after that, it'll be different. Tomato plants need to be watered after their first two weeks of daily watering. They need to be watered only twice a week but very deeply because the water needs to get down mm -hmm. deeply to the roots and you also need to make sure the roots are going to be looking for water down deep. So uh, that's another reason for not frequent watering of your tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Cucumbers are very... So we don't do any irrigation. We do all hand watering Good. Um, as well. And we do, we follow that routine as well a couple times a week, depending on if it works. Right. Now, cucumbers, you were talking about cucumbers. Yes. Cucumbers like uh, regular watering every day. Otherwise, if they get too much water all at once, you end up with these ball cucumbers with a little tail. Um, but if they're mm -hmm. watered regularly, they'll be even uh, they will look more even. And uh, I have mm -hmm. just left them out in the field or something and uh, or regular irrigation and then it rains and they get saturated with water and then they'll balloon up. Or if you uh, don't harvest on a regular basis, you get oversized <laughs> cucumbers, which can be very interesting. Um, the, mm -hmm. When they're too big, the seeds get to be uh, undigestible. So you have to scrape out the seeds in order to eat it. But they can be sweet, too, if they've had too much water. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question on, on cucumbers? Yes, it does. Um, what else would you... We're getting close to time here. So what else would you like to um, recommend new gardeners well you have to tend your test your soil uh you can get a ph test over at your garden center you can also get a uh, fertility test kit from your garden center to um find out how much npk you have but um mm -hmm. best idea is to at this time of year if you send it out to a, a soil testing lab it's going to take two weeks to get it back because it's they're inundated with uh, mm -hmm. soil testing right now. If you go in person to one of your um, agricultural experiment stations, you might be able to get your soil tested uh, 
while you're there. Uh, but right now with this epidemic, I don't encourage it. So it's best to try and do your own soil testing for now. Mm-hmm. Then add what you need. Okay. okay. If you've got sandy soil, add some compost to it. Okay. Here we go. You ready? If you want to sweeten acid soil, yeah. you're going to add lime or even wood ash. Um, lime is a mineral and it comes from the earth. So you're just adding something natural. If you have salt or chemical damage to your soil, you're going to add gypsum. If you have sweet soil, but you want it to become acid soil, you're going to add composted manures. For root crops, you're going to add more sand to your soil deeply. If you have sandy soil and you require more organic matter, you're going to add some compost. If you have clay soil that doesn't drain well, you're going to put in additional sand and organic matter. Um, depending, and again, depending on what kind of vegetables you want to grow, that will determine the kind of soil that you're going to need in your containers or out in your yard. Um, I discourage the use of rototilling. I prefer double digging to get deeper into your soil and then mulching with leaves or straw after you have planted or before you plant, plant right through it. I also discourage mm-hmm. the use of turning over your soil every year. Uh, by mulching, you can avoid that mm-hmm. and let the earthworms and biodiversity keep your soil nice and loose. And they will also help your mm-hmm. soil get deeper and deeper every year. So what happens if somebody didn't, didn't do that um, and they just allowed the beds to, say they got raised beds and they just, you know, it's an old garden and they just let the let the weeds be. If they want to turn over an old bed and they've got weeds growing in it, what do you suggest they do? You don't, you don't suggest they pull everything no, out? No, I would just scratch the surface to, to, um, uh, to uproot the leaves uh, and cover mm-hmm. them over with soil. If you take a, a flat shovel and slide it uh, mm-hmm. just barely under the soil, you break the roots and you'll uproot the, the weeds and flip it over. So the green is on the, on the bottom and the roots are on the top and um, add some compost over that. Then put your, your mulch down and plant right through it. That's a cool idea. There's a back breaking yeah. of pulling everything out. That's right. Um, some people use newspaper. They'll put down newspaper uh, to smother the weeds and plant through that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then put mulch. But in the if if you have mulch mm-hmm. your frame graze bed and it has gone through the winter with the mulch, you can put another layer of mulch over it, that of leaves or straw, and then plant right through it mm-hmm. without disturbing the soil. Mm-hmm. You see, we get weeds when we have bare soil. Okay. So we like to avoid mm-hmm. having more weeds by just planting through the mulch. You just open up the hole mm-hmm. big enough to plant in and uh, plant your seed or your plant and then cover it over with soil. The mulch can go right up to the edge of your plant. Mm-hmm. So would you be open to, towards the end of the summer, coming back on the show and talking about how people can put their, their garden to bed for the winter? Yes, I'd love to. Okay, good. All right, well, that's all the questions that I have. Where can people find you if they are interested in learning more about you and where you are? And if they have questions, um, they can hire you as a consultant. Where can they find you? My email is the best way to do it. Um, BettyLews.Gardening, B-E-T-T-Y-L-O-U-S dot Gardening, G-A-R-D-E-N-I-N-G, at S-N-E-T dot net. BettyLews.Gardening at S-N-E-T dot net. And my uh, cell phone that takes texts as well as phone calls, 860-268-6270. And I'm in Manchester, Connecticut, United States of America. You can also find me uh, at um, the Facebook pages of Betty Lou's Gardening 
and um, Betty Lou Sandy, as well as the Cheney Homestead Museum Facebook page. Cheney Homestead Museum, I have uh, videos on that one, all about historical gardening that can be applied to what we need today. Wonderful. Thank you, Betty Lou, for an incredible interview. You gave us some really good information, and I hope others think so too. I know I learned a lot. I also want to let you know that I recorded the interview in early May. So this is what, mid-June, and I'm finally getting around and finishing up the interview. And in the meantime, Betty Lou has changed her email address. So the old SNET address is not valid anymore. So I'm going to give you her newest email address. So it's Betty Lou Sandy, B-E-T-T-Y-L-O-U-S-A-N-D-Y, and the number is 18 at gmail.com. That's Betty Lou Sandy, 18, B-E-T-T-Y-L-O-U-S-A-N-D-Y, and the number is 18 at gmail.com. I've also updated her handouts with her new email address. Uh, I hope that you will check out Betty Lou's videos. Uh, I have links in the show notes. The Cheney Homestead a Museum, where she has posted all her gardening videos. Uh, and if you missed her contact information, I'll have that in the show notes. So don't forget to download her four handouts. Organic gardening, container gardening, vegetable gardening, to-do list. Where does food come from? And finally, don't forget to check out my latest book, My Gardening Journal, a how-to garden book for kids. It's available on Amazon, Kobo, draft to digital Google Books. You can also print the ebook version, a PDF, on my author's website, Brenda J. Sullivan Books.com. That's B R E N D A J Sullivan, S U L L I V A N books b-o-o-k-s dot com you can download the pdf version directly from me okay everybody thank you so much for listening i'll see you next time and have a happy summer day hi everyone it's brenda again just a few more things before you take off on fridays i'll post a quick newsletter called five herb friday sharing five things related to the world of herbs it could be a cool recipe a cool idea for using herbs around your home a diy bath and body product a gadget a book or an article or website i found helpful and think you might enjoy it too it will be short to the point and full of good positive energy that will send you off for an awesome weekend so go to livingandlovingherbs.com and sign up for this short email. This episode was brought to you by farmtobath.com, where our bath and body products are inspired by nature. Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat's milk soaps, body room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, and body oils using the herbs, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our garden. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical-free and GMO-free. This is just for our listeners of Living and Loving Herbs podcast. We're offering a buy one, get one free on our goat's milk herbal soaps. This offer is only for our podcast listeners. Just type in the promotion code LLH podcast at checkout. The code again is LLH podcast. Go to farmtobath.com and check out our products and don't forget to order your soap. Until next time, have a happy and blessed day and thank you for listening.